Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sasquatch Army. We're back yet again for another fun-filled episode. My name's Dave, here with Lance, as usual. Hello, everybody. And he picked today's topic, too. The attack at Ape Canyon. From all the way back in 1924. Where'd you hear about that one? I'm not sure where I went. But I've been fascinated with that encounter for quite a long time. Well, let's cue up the story. Hopefully everybody will be entertained by it and informed. And we will be right back. This is the official account of Ronald A. Beck of the Ape Canyon attack in 1924. First of all, I wish to give an account of the attack and tell the famous incident on July 1924 when the hairy apes attacked our cabin. We had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area in southwestern Washington. We had, from time to time, come across large tracks by creek beds and springs. In 1924, I and four other miners were working our gold claim, the Vanderwhite. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens, near a deep canyon now named Ape Canyon, which was so named after an account of the incident reached the newspapers. Hank, a pseudonym, as I'll call him from now, was a great hunter and good woodman. He was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large and we knew that no known animal could have made them. The largest measured 19 inches long. It was in the middle of July and we had received a good essay on our claim and everyone was excited. I remember I had a tooth that was aching and I suggested to Hank that he should take me down to see a dentist. But he was so enthused in the prospects of the gold mine he barely took time to answer me. He replied that God or the devil could not get him away from there. We'd all come up in his Ford and I had no way to get to town unless he took me. So when we went back to our cabin on the north side of the canyon, I had a nagging toothache and little appetite for our evening meal of beans and hotcakes. Hank, though apprehensive, was still determined. We'd been hearing noises in the evening for about a week now. We heard a shrill, peculiar whistling each evening. We would hear it coming from one ridge and then hear an answering whistling from another ridge. We also heard a sound which I could best describe as a booming, thumping sound just like something was hitting itself on its chest. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring about a hundred yards from our cabin to get some water and suggested we take our rifles, just to be on the safe side. We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle, and at that instant, I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about a hundred yards away on the other side of the little canyon, standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree and poked its head out from the other side and at the same time, Hank shot. I could see the bark fly out from the tree from each of his three shots. Someone may say that it was quite a distance that I could see the bark fly, but I saw it. The creature, I judged, had been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but when we saw it again, it was running fast and upright, about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot at it three times before it disappeared from view. We took the water back to the cabin afterwards and explained the affair to the rest of the party. We all agreed, including Hank, to go home the next morning as it would be dark before we could get to the car. We agreed it would be unsound to be caught by darkness on the way out. Nightfall found us in our pine log cabin. We would built the cabin ourselves and had it made very sturdy. It stood for years afterwards and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it was burned to the ground. The circumstances of the fire I do not recall. In the cabin we had a long bunk bed in which two could sleep, feet to feet, the rest of us sleeping on pine boughs on the floor. At one end of the cabin we had a fireplace fashioned out of rocks. There were no windows in the cabin, so darkness found all of us in the cabin more calm now. If my tooth was better, somehow the excitement seemed to work up a temporary cure on it. We were sitting around puffing on pipes and talking about the trip home the next day. Each of us settled down in his crude but welcome bed and soon fell asleep. About midnight we were all awakened. Hank, who was sleeping on the floor, was yelling and kicking, but the noise that had awakened us was a tremendous thud against the cabin wall. 
Some of the chinking had been knocked loose from between the logs and he had fell across Han Hank's chest. He had his rifle in his hand and was waving it back and forth as he kicked and yelled. Hank always slept with his gun nearby. It was a Remington automatic, my gun being a 30-30 Winchester, which I still have to this day. I helped to get the chinkin' off of him, and he jumped to his feet. Then we heard a great commotion outside. It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over a pine of unused shakes. We grabbed our guns. Hank squinted through the space left by the chinking. By actual count, we only saw three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the start of the famous attack, of which so much has been written in Washington and Oregon papers throughout the years. Most accounts tell of giant boulders being hurled against the cabin, and some say that some even fell through the roof, but this was not quite the case. There were a few very large rocks around in that area, but not that many. It is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break through the roof, but hit it with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. That's just not true. The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if they saw we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize we were only defending ourselves. We could have had clear shots at them through the opening left in the chinking had we chosen to shoot. We did shoot, however, when they climbed up on our roof. We shot round after round through that roof. We had to brace the huge log door with a long pole taken from the bunk bed. The creatures were pushing against it and the whole door vibrated from the impact. We responded by firing many more rounds through the door. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over, but this was pretty much an impossibility. As previously stated, the cabin was a sturdy made building. Hank and I did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to the far end of the cabin, guns in their hands. One had a pistol which is still in my family's possession. The others clutched their rifles. They seemed stunned and incredulous. The attack continued the remainder of the night with only short intervals in between. A more profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures, being close to the cabin, reached an arm through the chinking space and seized one of our axes by the handle. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the logs, and at the same time Hank shot, barely missing my hand. The creature let go and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place. A humorous thing I well remember was Hank singing, if you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone and we'll all go home in the morning. He did not mean it to be humorous, for Hank was dead serious and sang under the impression that the mountain devils, as he called them, might understand and go away. The attack ended just before daylight. Just as soon as we were sure it was light enough to see, we came cautiously out of the cabin. It was not long after before I saw one of the ape-like creatures standing about 80 yards away near the edge of Ape Canyon. I shot three times and it toppled over the cliff, down into the gorge, some 400 feet below. Then Hank said we should get out of there as soon as possible and not bother to pack our supplies or equipment. After all, he said, it's better to lose them than our lives. We were all only too glad to agree. We brought out only that which we could get in our pack sacks. We left about $200 in supplies, powder, and drilling equipment behind. I tried to persuade everyone not to relate the happenings to anybody, and they agreed. But Hank soon let the cat out of the bag. We made our way to Spirit Lake, and Hank went into the ranger station. He'd told the ranger earlier about the tracks, and the ranger replied, Let me know if you find out what they are. That was just what Hank did to the puzzlement of the ranger. When we were home back in Kelso, Washington, he told some of his friends, and somehow the story leaked out to the papers, and the great hairy ape hunt of 1924 was on. Local reporters interviewed us. They came from Portland and Seattle. Even a big game hunter from England came asking questions, and he had a large gun with him that must have been an elephant gun. Many people flocked to the Mount St. Helens area looking for the great hairy apes or mountain devils. I myself went back with two reporters and a detective from Portland, Oregon. We found large tracks, and they photographed them. 
We did not see any of the eight men then, nor could we find the ones we had shot. So people were asking questions. Was it true, or just a wild tale? I can assure you it's true. Are they human, animal, or devils? I will answer that question in this book. That was the Great Ape Hunt of 1924. In the last few years, more and more people had reported seeing them. There's an ape hunt being revived again, and another man had written a book on the subject, and it's formed a club whose purpose is to find evidence to prove what they already believe. That abominable snowman of America does exist. This was told by Fred Beck of Kelso, Washington, written in his book on September 27, 1967. Yeah, we're back. So that is the uh, story of Ape Canyon. Fred Beck, I got to tell you, back back in those days, guys like that, miners, hunters, all that, trackers, they, they had some stones on them. I was just going to say the same thing. They had some steel nerves. This day and age, you know, everybody screams and shouts, oh, my God, there's a spider. Yeah, and someone would have opened that door and ran for it and just let them all in. <laughs> yeah, if they would come in. And you know who would have opened the door? Some dumb blonde. <laughs> yeah, trying to get a cell we have, signal. We have to get out of here. <laughs> no, the dumb blonde would probably be, they'd probably be looking for a cell signal. <laughs> yeah, that too. I gotta call my friend about this. Has somebody seen my phone? <laughs> I would like to think that I wouldn't do what they did, but in the same sense, I think I would have. I just would have started shooting. Yeah, I was gonna say, what would you do differently? Did anything differently? I with that many being being surrounded by that many of them. I think I would have just started shooting. I don't think there's anything different from that I would do. I would be thinking they're looking to put me on the menu. That's just my feeling from that whole encounter is that they were looking to, you know, pop yep. them up. Yep. Oh, hey, were. my microphone's acting up again. What a shocker. There we go. We're back. Did you see? Uh, or did you see? <clears throat> you were just about to say Cliff Brackman went to that area? Yeah, I believe a couple of years ago. I'm not sure. I don't think it was on Finding Bigfoot. I think it was just posted on the internet on his website. But him and another gentleman or two other people went to go looking for it. And apparently they did find it or remnants of the cabin. But it was so badly degraded, they could barely even make it out. But it was, apparently it was uh, so far back, they had to climb up mountains and everything to get to this location. So it was no easy place to get to. That doesn't surprise me, especially uh, during the old gold hunting days. Yeah, like you can understand why those gold miners did not leave that uh their hut at nighttime, that's for sure. Yeah. They would have had absolutely zero help. Safest place to be would have been in that cabin. That's probably why they stayed until morning. I'd but certainly you, be staying in that cabin. Yeah. You would think, though, after it all happened, that shortly after they you know, got back to civilization and just said something to someone that they would have gone right back to the cabin just to see what had happened. But you never hear that part of the story. But I'm actually kind of surprised that no one's actually thought of building a cabin there again and just see what happens. Well, the thing is, is trying to find the exact spot that the original cabin was before it got torn down by the elements. Yeah. Well, that's where uh, Cliff Brockman would come in handy because him and his buddies apparently found it. 
Like it doesn't have to be the exact spot, but even just somewhere in the general area, just to see if they're still around, it may piss them off again. It makes you wonder if they stay in a specific area because I'm of the belief that they migrate because of the spots that I have activity in that I've gone to for many years. They're only there around a certain time of the year. And I believe that they migrate due to the seasons Mm -hmm. for food. I believe that as well. If they can. Like for my neck of the woods, I'm, I'm surrounded by the Great Lakes. So for the ones around here, they've got really nowhere to go. Unless they want to walk, you know, the 2,000 miles to get around the Great Lakes. Oh, well, that's a hell of a hike. Oh, yeah. Well, that'll about do it for this episode of the Sasquatch Army. Catch us next week, where we'll come up with something else cool to talk about. Good night, everybody. Good morning, good, morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I tried to contain myself there. I didn't want to laugh out loud saying I fucked that up. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>